Okay? Yes. So I'm going to give two talks, and on the whole I recommend you come to tomorrow's rather than today's. Um, today's is a research seminar. It's about, um, and, and quite different to tomorrow's. Tomorrow's is, in, is educational. Today I'm going to talk about um, the work that was published just a few weeks ago in the Journal of Fluid Mechanics. It's a very specialized um, research problem. It is extremely tough, the and I'm going to take you through the technical details. And uh, while you won't learn all the technical details, I hope you will see that it is possible to tackle a tough problem and get answers um, by advanced techniques. Tomorrow, I'm going to talk about some um, uh, give a general review. I will talk about the results that come in some 30 odd uh, papers, mostly not my own, and I'm only interested in the general results with no technical details. I will have two or three equations, but they're rather symbolic and I don't do much with them. Okay, so today's problem is going to be very tough. And it's about this phenomena here. So there's a vertical fiber, you can make out just there, there's a vertical fiber and liquid which would, you would like to coat uniformly along has gone into drops. Um, this are, these are Newtonian uh, liquids and it came originally this problem for trying to coat um, optical fibers. Um, uh, I actually picked up the problem when I was visiting a laboratory in Paris where they would happen to be doing it with shear thinning fluids. It was for a shampoo company, and they wanted to know wh whether that would happen on your hair, which is not such a good idea. So I'm interested in the formation of these drops um, on, um, from a thin coating on a vertical fiber. So let's see what's next. Okay, so I will use a power law fluid because that um, uh, was the shampoo. That is where the viscosity is a function of the shear rate with some power. And you can see here there's some experimental data by the Paris group where there, over a matter of a couple of decades you can fit a power law behavior. So the geometry is uh, a vertical fiber with some radius A, um, uh, and then I'm going to measure X along downwards <coughs> along the fiber. I'm going to have a thin coating whose thickness is H, which will vary uh, in actual position and time. It's going to be axisymmetric. At the very end, if you want to ask, no, no, I don't like Paul. It's much better for me if I dance like this because I open my chest and all the voice comes out. If I sit with a pointer like that, you can not hear the voice come out. All these pointers and computers are bad for lecturing. Okay. And I'm going to measure a distance. Well, I don't think this occurs very often, but it would from the surface of the fiber. Right, so we need some governing equations. And uh, is, it's going to be within the framework of lubrication theory. I think there were some lectures on lubrication theory. Um, so you, this is going to use exactly that lubrication theory. So I've got a vertical force. There's some pressure variations with, uh, along the axis of the fiber. And then um, there are the viscous stresses varying in distance away from the, uh, in distance across the uh, thin film. Um, the pressure comes from the capillary pressure, this surface tension, and to the first approximation, the, f the thin film will have the curvature of the fiber, and that will be a constant curvature, so there's no pressure gradient, so there's nothing happening. And I'm interested in what happens when the thin film has a little a thickness, so the cylinder expands a bit and the pressure goes down, that's this term, or perhaps the thin film wiggles along the axis, in which case there are then there's curvature in this plane that you're seeing, and that will produce some variations of pressure, and it's th those variations in pressure along the axis which will drive a flow. 
So you do your lubrication theory and you can calculate the velocity profile. You can do it for a power law fluid and it gives you a flux of flu fluid down the uh, coating which depends on gravity and the pressure gradient and uh, the thickness. And because there's a power law, in the viscosity depends on the shear rate to some power, n minus 1. You get lots of little n's decorating here. So that doesn't... Uh, so small, uh, the Newtonian case, the constant viscosity case, we're used to h cubed is the standard result. When n is 1, you have h cubed. So these are small modifications for um, a power law fluid. And the finally governing equation is that the thickness changes in time because there's more fluid arriving than is leaving. There's a divergence in the flux of fluid down the fiber that will make the fiber expand. Yeah. So they're the governing equations. Yeah, but it's volume flux. Agreed, this is lubrication theory, in which there, in lubrication theory you ignore inertia if you're biased. You can try putting it in and you get into a mess. So I have a time dependence in that this very viscous fluid, if it's flowing differently, it will make the thickness change. Right, so we have some governing equations there if I put them all together. And don't do that to me. So I have to non-dimensionalize it, and uh, one non-dimensionalizes the uh, length scale um, along the axis in terms of fiber radius and the thickness of the film in terms of the initial um, uh, uniform thickness of the fiber. And the time scale is th there's a Rayleigh instability that if you were to have a fiber, a horizontal fiber, um, with the coating on it, what is the time scale of which the cylinder of liquid prefers to try and form um, uh, into um, spheres? It's the Rayleigh plateau instability, and it has a time scale that depends on the viscosity. My viscosity is in my power law fluid is, is this beta factor. There's surface tension driving the um, instability. So there's a time scale, and if I use, if I non dimensionalize, the problem, my governing equation, is relatively simple, that um, you're used to power law 1, uh, constant viscosity fluids, when it will be an h cubed. But it would be st a standard lubrication equation of h cubed. And then there's the capillary pressure, its gradient, and then the divergence of that flux. And this uh, governing equation, I I'm going to be, uh, cons governs everything I'm going to do in has one non-dimensional parameter. It's a sort of bond number. It's the ratio of the hydrostatic pressure to the capillary pressure. So there's uh, those two phys bits of physics in um, gravity and surface tension, and the ratio of those two forces is uh, called a bond number, and is modified by a factor of A divided by H, which is the uh, because of thin film geometry. Right, so we'd like to uh, tackle that. So we put that equation um, on a computer and solved it. Um, one is interested in um, um, flow going along in this direction. This is down the fiber. Um, and we're going to wiggle the initial uh, input is wiggled um, uh, with a simple oscillation. How does things develop downstream? And this is uh, in gray at time 230 and at red 250. You see that for this value of the parameter g of just over a half, that it develops into, uh, there are very small things we can't see here. They amplify and then they break up into um, pulses which um, grow in time. So we're getting effectively single drops issued in time. On the other hand, if I have a slightly larger value, I go up from 5.5 to 1, 
then less happens, and you can see here now the input wiggling coming along. It's growing. There's a horrible nonlinear mess, and after that, it issues um, these. I'm going to claim that this is the same size as that. It nearly is. And if you, I were to show a longer computation, it would settle down to a unique size. There are independent traveling solitary waves, um, which have nothing to do with the frequency of the input here. And it's, these are the drops that uh, one can see in this case of uh, the larger value of G. That corresponds to a slightly thinner initial film. So this talk is all about these fairly large um, solitary waves being sent down. Uh, when do they occur? Sometimes they occur, sometimes they don't occur. And um, what are their properties? So if I'm interested in a, a, a solitary wave, a, f a wave that is propagating without change, I can go to the, f change the frame. I will sit in the frame moving with this traveling wave where it will appear steady. And if I do that, my governing equation has the speed that I'm traveling in, and I can integrate it once and um, apply some conditions that it goes to uniform film before an arc drop, and then I'd like to solve this equation. So this is what the talk is about, how to solve this equation, um, both numerically and asymptotically. Um, the physics is the, sets the parameter g, that's the ratio of gravity and surface tension, and the unknown is the form of h as a function of position, and also the speed at which it travels, and c is a sort of eigenvalue. This is a horrible nonlinear eigenvalue problem. Now, while we impose the value of g by setting up the uh, experiment, and it delivers the value of c, in the mathematical analysis, it's easier to think of c as a function of g rather than g as a function of c. So I shall make expansions in c being very big. g happens to be round about uh, 0 0.5 in the interesting regime. And it's these little variations around the critical value that are important. And, uh, it, small variations around the critical value lead to very large values of C and very large values of H of X. And uh, it's better to use 1 upon C as the small parameter in order to make an asymptotic expansion. Yes, yes. For me, the, def what's the definition of infinity? It's a serious I philosophical issue. Infinity, if you're a pure mathematician and have been taught what infinity is, is a number bigger than you're interested in today. So, so six is the answer. I don't have to go to the initial conditions. I just have to get out of this solitary wave, and it turns out to be two pi in size. So six, okay? If you ever integrate a Gaussian, the answer's three. I do like interruptions. It's more interesting than the talk. OK. So um, firstly, I'm going to solve this numerically. And it is just not simple. You don't say, give it to MATLAB or something like that. It would not do it. Um, I'm going to teach you how to s solve this, this problem, an eigenvalue problem. I don't know C. I've got to integrate this differential equation from infinity to infinity and get it right. Um, and uh, so let's start. How do you do that? So the trick is you integrate from minus infinity to zero, and you integrate from plus infinity to zero, and you stick the two together. And initially, they don't stick together. And then you fiddle around until they stick together. So to start, to go from minus infinity, OK, from minus 6 and to, from plus 6, um, I have to understand what's happening out there. Now, as it gets tending to 1, it's going to be 1 plus a little bit. So I can linearize this equation around 1 and try and understand what on earth is happening then. So I linearize the equation, and it turns, turns into a third-order differential equation, but it's a linear equation. And I can look at the roots of the cubic 
Um, there's a value of the constant that isn't very important. And uh, there are three exponential solutions. So it turns out that there is one exponential solution which has a real and uh, positive um, exponent. And there are two um, exponential solutions which are complex and they have a negative real part. So this one, blow, with a real positive part, blows up. So we start use that one from shooting, actually I seem to have shot from minus 12. Um, and I uh, use that, I want something that is growing as I go forward. So that's this thing will grow as I go forward. There's one adjustable parameter, there's one degree of freedom in the problem. And then from shooting from uh, um, this side, where I've also gone from plus 12, I... Um, I want things that grow in this direction, so I want things with a negative real part. And uh, there are two, two solutions there. Uh, they're complex conjugates. So there's a sort of amplitude and a phase between them, and I have two degrees of freedom there. Right, so I'm going to do that. So I shoot from the back with the one growing solution, the, the, the two decaying might as well be set to zero, and I stop, I don't quite know where x is zero, uh, is I stop when the curvature is zero and when it's a downward facing slope. Um, let's just go back to that. So I'm going to shoot from here and when the curvature stop is zero I stop and it's going downwards. Because it's only in the linearized domain that it is exponentially ah. And I've gone to a bigger number. Okay, and then, um, so I, I get to one point. Then I shoot from the front where I've got some two solutions, an amplitude and a phase, and I, I have to just, just guess an amplitude and phase initially, and I uh, shoot until I get to the same point where the curvature vanishes and it's downward facing. There's a little subtlety that it, the amplitude has to be interesting. You see, because there's a lots of little in oscillations here you can't see, and the curvature vanishes in a downward slope, and, and it, you, won't, you don't want to stop there. You want to wait until the amplitude's got above 1.5, when it's become interesting. 1.5 is negotiable but it, when it's become interesting. Right, so at this stage, we've got something come from the back and something come from the fruit, front, and we stop when the curvature is equal. Unfortunately, the slopes won't be equal and the value won't be equal. So at this stage, you start fiddling, and you fiddle with the phase at the beginning until you can make the values equal. So we've got the curvature, the second derivative and the value equal. We haven't got the first derivative equal. And then we fiddle with the speed until we get the slopes equal. And then you've got a solution. Like that. So this is a shear thinning fluid and some value of the parameter, <coughs> the, uh, parameter g. Right. So I can generate solutions, and then I can go and investigate how does the maximum height and how does the speed that it's moving at vary with the parameter g and with for different shear thinning fluids. It sequentially, first match h, and then when you tweak c, you don't go back to a mismatch and so oh, on. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it's, mu it's much worse than I've described. Yeah, and, and, and if you don't guess reasonably well, it's a bad idea. So you have to do parameter continuation. You get one solution for one value of g, and then you change g a bit and hope that you can start with nearby values that you've had before. And you, it would be possible to, it's a nonlinear problem. It is possible to vary that parameter and this parameter simultaneously and do a two-dimensional search. It works much better there. I think it would be possible to do better than I've done, like doing two-dimensional searches. 
Um, but um, uh, um, I've generated lots of solutions, and I'm content. And there's worse, I've more work for me to do elsewhere. Yeah, yeah, I have to keep re. So, so I've, I vary this parameter and I have to solve, I have to resolve that one. And yes, when I vary C, I've got to solve that and that. And again, you will match A to 3 again. Yeah, and, and yeah, if you vary C, I have to resolve there and then I have to fiddle with that until it's right. Then I vary C and I have to do those two and vary this one until that's then. Yeah. It's sort of quarter an hour solution by unintelligent human solution rather than programming. The trouble is if you program a two-dimensional search, um, it's very uns they tend to be unstable and you have to, it's, it's not simple. You can do sort of Newton Raphson when you're nearly there, but if you're not nearly there, um, binary chopping is a bit hard in two dimensions. We do, I did do binary, ch I did, some of these fiddlings here is actually done by a binary chop and then that's done by a binary chop. So it's semi-automated. Okay, so um, uh, I think th this is for the um, Newtonian case, and some people before us had obtained some solutions, ah, um, and um, uh, we've reproduced them. So it turns out that if the uh, parameter g is less than uh, 0 0.55, well, 5, rather 4, there is a finite time blow up, and my solitary waves that I'm interested in exist um, uh, for higher values of g. They have quite a small value of the maximum height uh, values of g at 2, and I'm interested now in what happens when the maximum value of these gets quite large. The um, Right, so that's what uh, that says. And um, here are two, some solutions of different values of g. A, sm a large value of g of 1 is the sm smallest wave, and as the value of g decreases, the height gets bigger. You'll notice that all the solutions sit within a certain distance of 2 pi. So the width is constant, independent of g, roughly speaking. These wiggles are relatively the same, but the height is changing. And that there's a f critical value of g means that um, uh, here's m what the parameter g, the bond number is. It's this hydrostatic pressure over surface tension. And um, uh, that there's a critical value of g means that the initial thickness is proportional to the radius of the fiber cubed. And that was found by David Kerry um, in, um, the, in 1990. Um, some very nice experiments um, where he had a little blob, blob of liquid and he pulled a fiber out. Uh, he had, had a big wire that was fed through this, um, uh, through this drop and he pulled it out and s looked to see whether or not little bulges occurred. And he found the critical thickness for it to form noticeable bulges varied with the... Uh, radius of the fiber cube. So there's experimental um, verification. Right now I should tell you about this first paper and how I got into this sub, uh, research problem. So I visited a laboratory in uh, Paris that I often visit and saw these experiments on shampoo with shear thinning fluids and I said, aha, there was this work in 94 of a, with a constant viscosity so it would be very good to start my new research student on the shear thinning fluid because shear thinning fluid as anything, and um, uh, it, would, it would take her two months to solve this shear thinning generalization of a pre-existing paper, and then when we've solved something, we can go back to the Paris lab and find uh, some more interesting things that are happening there. There's some elastic effects that, uh, that were happening, which you can ask for, about at the end if you wish. Um, unfortunately, after ten months of, rather than two months, the research student sort of came to me in near tears saying she couldn't get any solution at all. And it is because this paper in JFM is wrong. And it, I, w I was resistant to that idea. I thought it was right. Um, and after 10 months, she persuaded me the paper was wrong. And so we had to redo that. 
And then it turned out that doing n equals 1 is not much help at solving n not equal to 1. But uh, we got our techniques going. Okay, so here's some solutions for uh, um, different power law fluids. The black is um, constant viscosity, n equals 1. The blue are shear thinning, and the red are uh, shear thickening fluids. This is the maximum height. This is the velocity as a function of the parameter g. And you can see that uh, when, for the shear thinning fluids, there are in fact are two branches. There's a small h, and there's a large H in a small region. So we're going to look at the, uh, what happens up here when the speed is high and the amplitude, maximum amplitude is high. And I'm interested in what is the value of that, the critical value where it blows up to infinity, and what is the relationship between um, the f structure of the solution and the speed as a function of g. And I'm going to do an asymptotic expansion in large C to find out what g and h depend on. OK, so it's a matched asymptotic expansion. Uh, problem and there's a main body in the middle and there's a little transition region at the front and a little transition region at the front and at the back. So in the uh, main body you have a big H and X is of size 1. In the, f in the two transition regions at the front and the back the uh, H is uh, size 1 but there are very small variations in X. And this is very complicated. It's the most complicated problem I have ever solved. So this is matched asymptotics at its limits. So, let's start. Uh, I hope to keep you for the first two terms or so. Um, so if H is big, then that means this right-hand side is negligible. And if H is big, that G is not very good. So it's just that equals zero. That's easy. We can all solve that. It's just cosine. So to be precise, h is 1 minus cosine of x, and because that has a size 2, there's a half here, so it's a half the maximum value, 1 minus cosine x, and the um, capillary pressure is sitting at a minus half h max. And it has an existence over naught and 2 pi, and as you go down towards x equals 0 or x equals 2 pi, there's a quadratic variation of this function 1 minus cosine of x. And we want that quadratic variation. It has a coefficient of the uh, a quarter of the maximum height as we go to the, towards the front and the back. Right, so that's the middle bit, the, lead, the main body. Then the tr two little transition regions... Uh, we have h of size 1, but we have very rapid variations, so the derivatives are important, and c is big, and uh, h is of size 1, but because c is big and h is size 1, we can forget g, and equally we can forget g here, because that's big, and we can forget that because the derivatives are big. So the simplification is to get a... Um, modified Bretherton equation. Bretherton solved this in the case of n equals 1 for studying how bubbles go down tubes. And we've just got a um, power law fluid generalization of that, and we have to f copy what he did in solving that equation, but we've got an n sitting there. Right. <coughs> and there's some stretch it variable where c is big, this means there's only little variations between the front and the back. So, uh, x naught will be either 0 or 2 pi, and then that will be order 1 when this is small and that's large. OK, so when you, you have to solve this from uh, um, 
uh, the uniform film growing up into the main body and it goes into the main body we get a quadratic and we can see that that once H is beginning to get big as we're going into the main body the central part H gets big this drops to zero so three derivatives is zero so we have a quadratic variation and we have one degree of freedom that we can spend and get rid of the linear term. That's really effectively saying I can move the origin for this solution. I've spent one degree of freedom of getting rid of the quadratic, of getting rid of the linear term. So I have a quadratic variation and a, um, a constant, and it's different for whether it's the front or the back transition region, a plus sign or a minus sign there. Right, so we can then go to matching the, uh, the leading order between these two transition regions and the main body. And to do that, the um, back region has one degree of freedom, but I've spent it by saying that the linear term is zero, so I've got no degrees of freedom, which means that the value of P and R, P and R are Bretherton's, um, the quadratic variation come when you solve this equation, and then the constant, um, that uh, quadratic and constant terms, as you come out of the transition region, um, they're uniquely determined at the back. At the front, it's a little different. Um, at the front, there were two degrees of freedom. We had those two exponentials, the oscillating exponentials. And uh, I've spent one of the degrees of freedom by making the linear term zero. That's just an origin shift, really. And so there's one degree of freedom left, which means there's a one-parameter family of uh, P and R, the quadratic and constant terms, and the matching will fix that. So because we have to match both the back and the front to the same quadratic variation, we have to match this behavior from the transition regions with the main body, we are going to have have to have the same value of P. So P plus is uniquely determined. P minus, there's a one parameter family, but because it's got to be the same value, I can pick which value of the family. Having picked which value of the family, I get that R minus is fixed. So I've now got the P's and the R's out of the region, and the matching um, of this um, transition region to the main body gives me a relationship between the value of P that I know, it's about 0.6. It varies with uh, the shear thinning number of N, it varies with the speed. So we're getting part of the solution. We've got the shape in the middle. We've got the variation of the maximum height with the speed. Uh, well, we better check that we're behaving, uh, that, that it's right. So I have numerical solutions. This is a shear thickening case. These are the original profiles as G decreases to the critical value. And I can check that they scale. If I scale the <coughs> with this uh, speed to some strange power, they all fall on top of one another. So the numerics agrees with the back again, very sensitive. And equally, I can look at the transition region where H is of size 1, but I know that I have to scale the X variation by this stretching with the, the, some power of C. C is a big parameter, and you see the three, the three solutions fall on top of one another in this region. I don't expect it to work there, like I don't expect things to work down there. So I've checked that that leading order asymptotics agrees with the um, uh, numerical solutions, and I might believe both of them when they both agree. So, so far, we have got how does the maximum height vary with the speed when the speed is getting fast and the maximum height is getting far large, but we don't have g, the critical value. We don't have, have g, how g varies with c. Okay, well, we nearly do. So as we come out of the transition regions, we have a quadratic variation, and there's a constant. So, it, it, so if you're in looking at, as you come out of the transition region, it looks like the film thickness has a slightly different thickness 
um, that it's come from before it sort of set off on the quadratic variation. And an apparent thickness in some sense. <coughs> and um, uh, if we, uh, we've got, we're going to have to go to the uh, correction term. And uh, so I've got the leading term already, and I'm going to put an order one correction term in here. And um, at that stage, this term becomes important. It will be order one. But in the main body, H is big-ish, so we can forget all the right-hand side. So we're just going to solve that is zero. And we can solve that. And uh, we have, effectively, a hydrostatic pressure variation and something else that nicely vanishes at the two ends and gets my slopes to zero at the two ends, which I need. And then I have to uh, fit to the constant at one end. And then when I say, please fit to the constant at the other end, I can determine the value of g, because there'll be a 2 pi there. So I, I've now from these slightly different apparent thicknesses found the critical value of the parameter g. And what has happened is that the top is slightly fatter than the bottom. So the top um, uh, looks as if it, 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 let's call it, it sort of looks a bit to the, in the matching, in the sense of matching, a bit thicker than the bottom. So the bottom has got a slightly higher pressure, the capillary pressure, because it's slightly thinner film, it's got a higher pressure there. And then we have a hydrostatic pressure because of the height of the drop. So it's the length, 2 pi times the strength of gravity, g, is equal to the difference in the thicknesses top and bottom. That's all I'd say. Right. Yes, yes, please. a microphone behind oh, you. Sorry. Uh, you showed a picture where in the numerical simulation there were these uh, waves that were separated by a long distance. Yes, yes. So there could be many of them, right? And we are just isolating one of them and looking at yes, that. Yes, yes. This is jolly good for an isolated one because mm -hmm. this, this solution goes down exponentially. But then how, how does it match with the next one? So if you have... Doesn't. doesn't. No, no. But, but the... the uh, as you come out of this solution, it decays exponentially. It's worse than decaying exponentially because the exponent is c to the um, three uh, n upon three. So, so it decays extremely rapidly exponentially. So, if you've gone one wave back of, of uniform thickness, there's no there's no detectable disturbance caused on the next one. So they exist as isolated objects. OK. Um, I don't know how you're doing for time. Badly, probably. OK, so I do have to go and, way, uh, have to go and find these coefficients. And the way I do it numerically, to find them accurately, I just don't find a numerical solution and say, please, what is the quadratic and linear terms? Um, I go away and find substitute this into the governing equation and by hand find the two correction terms, there'll be more correction terms, that I know the coefficients, they're horribly complicated expressions. This term is going to crop up quite a lot, so it's in red. And then I fit, not that, but I fit that to the numerical data in a least squared sense over a fairly large range as a result, I can determine this number into one part in 10 to the minus 5, and I can determine this at one point in 10 to the minus 3. So that's how I get accurate numbers here. Um, and I, I would like to get this more accurately, but uh, that's the best I can do fitting on this parameter regime. I'd have to get more terms here to have a better fit. And then, as I said, these uh, important parameters, um, outputs, the coefficient of the quadratic and the linear terms, they uh, vary with the power law fluid behavior results obtained. Okay, so we have found 
how the maximum height depends on the speed. We found the critical value of the parameter g. We've yet to find how g varies with c or c varies with g. We just know the critical value. So we have to go to more terms. And this is embarrassing. So I'm used to doing asymptotic analyses where the leading approximation is mostly found, but there's an odd parameter that you don't know. And you have to go to the correction question to determine the value of the param uh, an unknown parameter at leading order. And on the whole, you don't solve the correction term. You get a secularity condition, an integrability condition on from the second order problem, so from the correction term, that it f finally determines the leading order. So far, I've got the leading order and the correction, and I've yet to solve the problem. In fact, I'm have to go to the next correction and fully solve the next correction before I've eventually solved the leading order question. And in the reason why Kaliadesis and Chen didn't solve the constant viscosity problem correctly was to solve the constant viscosity, you have to go to the third correction and fully calculate the third correction before you get the leading order right. They went to the second correction and a half and failed to solve lots of things. Right. So I've got to go to the second correction for the shear thinning fluid. So yeah, in the, in the main body I've got the big um, thing, this uh, order one correction has just determined G naught and I have to think what's the next term? The answer is it's this and then G naught gets perturbed by the same thing and there are complications with the power law index N there. And then I jump into, I find the governing equation is this. So um, actually in n equals 1, I can solve that analytically, believe it or not. Um, uh, and I, with one sheet, two sheets of A4, beat my research student with MATLAB, um, or Mathematica, and got a much better solution than she got. However, you can't do it for n being fractional not equal to 1. So here I can integrate it a few times um, and get down to a one integral which is a, not a singular integral. Initially it's a singular behavior and you have to integrate um, and get the singular terms which are here and then there's a non-singular term there um, that is safe to evaluate numerically. And um, when you start doing the matching you find that it, this behaves like the red term that I had before then there's a constant and then there's a linear variation. And um, we, the, the red term matches very nicely something we've had before from out of, tr out of the transition regions. And the constant is different at the front and the back and there's nothing to match it to at this order. And that means you have to play the card that I can set this equal to the difference it, if I go from... Uh, if I can go from x equals 0 at the back to x equals 2 pi at the front, then I can set that two times 2 pi equal to the difference in the two g's to get the matching correct. Right, sorry, exactly that. So I have now found this term here. So I now know how g varies with c at last. So I've got a theory, and you can see it was a big mess there. So it, it may not be right. So I have to go away and test it. And to test it, I'm going to plot um, C as a function. Well, one upon C blows to infinity. So we have to plot 1 upon C as a function of G. And in fact, because this G is linear in that 1 upon C to a strange power, I'm going to plot, plot that 1 upon c to a strange power versus g, and I should have a linear variation. And you can see that as c goes to infinity, so 1 upon c to some power goes to 0, that are the numerical solutions are coming down on the asymptotic. So I had the val critical value of g, I've just found the slope, the g1, and you can see that eventually the numerical solutions come down to fit. Um, okay. How are we doing? Very good. 
So there, there, there's a negative slope and a positive slope fine. The one problem in is that when n is equal to 1, g is 1 is equal to 0. And I say here the slope is negative in for shear thinning and positive for shear thickening, which means I'm telling you the slope is 0 when uh, for n equals 1 for a constant viscosity case, and therefore I don't know anything. So I would have to go to a higher order. So I can go to a higher order. <laughs> Having solved, I'm telling you about the shear thinning the power law fluid case, we did have to solve the constant viscosity case first in order to, before we pr could proceed to the shear thinning fluid, as I'm t telling you about it the other way around. And there we got the leading order, and to prove that there was nothing, as it was a very complicated problem where we had to go to the third correction before we'd solve the problem, in order to prove that we were right, and there was nothing wicked further downstream in the correction terms, we then got another three terms. So this is what happens in the shear thinning case, that so far I've discussed the leading order, the thing that determined G1, G0, the thing that determined G0, and then I can add two more terms in the main body, um, and I get... This, oh, this is in the transition region. So in the transition region, we've only found this term, actually. So I'm there adding one, two, three, four terms. So these are the governing equations, and these are the behaviors that you have to find numerically. Um, and then in the main body, the governing equation is that. And we've already talked about this term and this term and this term, but I'm going to add three more terms and their governing equations. I mean, I'm, I'm expanding this, therefore, by this term. When you work out what terms you've got here, you can work out what corrections you'll get to there. So this is going to be a correction to the first approximation. Uh, we get a sequence of qu questions on the left-hand side with a sequence of solutions on the right-hand side. And then we're into matching them, and this is how the matching works. So that we have the, uh, from the... Um, From the transition regions, we have the first approximation I've talked about and then some things I've not talked about, and they will produce solutions with various powers of C with various functions of X. And you set up a big table like that. So that's the transition region where the main body, um, we have the first approximation, which I've expanded in X, the second, which we've, I've shown you, which I've expanded in X, but then there will be further, and the third term I showed, and then that, that determined this D, and then there are some more terms here, all been expanded. Then you stick them all together, and you can determine the unknown constants and read off the value of G0, G1, G2. So now I've got an improved theory of how G varies with C, and I can test it numerically. So before I was, um, I plotted it the other way around. Um, uh, instead of C as a function of C to a strange power, function of G is G as a function of power. So and before I had a linear variation, now I've got a sort of quadratic variation. You see m my blue second correction is doing much better at predicting the red numerical results. So I've got the right coefficient in those two cases. Okay. So th there is a problem with the constant viscosity, and if you really want to know about it, I can show you if you ask a question. But there is one problem still left. So I've been talking about what happens up in the sky there, in the asymptotic limit, and someone should have criticized me from ever going up there in the case of shear thinning fluids because we have two solutions. There are two branches of solutions. So this value of G here, no, out here there's a single solution, out here there's no solution, but there's a little band here where there is, for one value of G, there's a solution which has rather a small propagated traveling wave and a second solution with a large one, and it turns out the large one is unstable. 
and therefore I have to go away and numerically and find out here. This is the largest observable one. I can't observe that experimentally because it's unstable, but I can observe the nose. So I have to find what the nose is, and then I can predict the largest observable solution. So this is the la maximum si uh, size of uh, H as a function of the shear thinning index, and this is the speed of that solution um, as a function of the shear thinning. And um, this is how um, uh, G, the, <coughs> the critical value of G at the nose varies with N. So I've been talking about the G0, but the nose is something different. Um, when we have significant shear thinning. you notice these solutions stop at a shear thinning index of a half. Below a half, you have to do a whole th number of other things. And I'm not going to talk about that. So, um, I've sort of vaguely finished, unless you ask a difficult question. Um, I've shown that I can solve for these propagating waves. It's a horrible asymptotics problem. It's a horrible numerical problem. And it's only because I managed to get the numerics and the asymptotics to agree, I believe I've not made a big mistake. I think I could easily have made a mistake in both of them. So it's very important to, when you're doing difficult problems, to get agreement between numerical methods and asymptotic methods. And the numerical methods you, you, you use in real research problems are much worse a much more difficult numerical methods are required, more advanced numerical than the things you get taught. Equally, the asymptotics could be much more difficult than you're taught in, um, in graduate classes. So I've solved it. Um, I've suppressed the Newtonian case, but we've solved that. There's a very simple question, what happens when G is not small, near this critical value where everything blows up, but it is very large, then H is, pretty, is near to 1, and it's very easy, nearly. Um, um, th there's something very interesting that happens that you do. So I haven't talked about any physics, and physics is actually more interesting to me than the mathematics I've been showing you. So the interesting physics is the p shear thinning fluids. That's when the viscosity gets smaller as the uh, shear rate increases. In my problem, the thing that causes strange behavior is at what happens when the shear rate goes to zero. For a power law fluid, a shear thinning fluid, actually the viscosity gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And therefore, when I solve what, uh, my, my um, problem, out um, in, in the front and in the back, as I go down to uniform thickness, the disturbances are going to zero. If the disturbances are going to zero, the shear rates are going to zero, so the viscosity is getting bigger, so the shear rates get smaller, so the shear viscosity gets even bigger, so the shear, and actually it stops in a finite distance. So there's, there's a similar thing if you actually take a sh power law fluid and wiggle the top plate, do you do the Rayleigh problem. We've all solved the viscous flow problem underneath an oscillating plate, and it decays oscillating exponentially. It, there's an exponential decay with oscillation. For a power law fluid, it stops in a finite distance because the disturbed driving forces go down, therefore the, viscos the shear rates go down, so the viscosity goes up, so the flow goes down, so the shear rates, <coughs> so the shear rates go down, so the, the viscosity goes up and it's in an ever-ending cycle and it just stops in a finite distance. So that's what I learned in this problem. There's that happening. Okay, I've worked in the thin film. You can actually do th solve this problem where the drop is big, but the film in front of it is thin and behind it. Um, I've not gone back to the experiments, which is bad behavior by me. I should have gone to the experiments. But I've got interested in an elastic effect. I've got a couple of minutes so I can describe this. That um, uh, we have flow down a fiber and... Um, there's a non ax and I've looked at axisymmetric solutions. So if the 
if the um, there's an you can have uh, I've looked at axis symmetric so there's a non-axis symmetric instability if the fiber is not central on the coating. So if the coating's a bit thinner on one side and a bit thicker on the other side, still possibly a cylindrical shape of the fiber, of the coating, so there's no capillary pressures trying to change the, th the fact that it's thicker on one side and thinner on the other. If it's thicker on one side, then the gravity will drive faster flows on the thicker th side and higher shear rates. If there are higher shear rates, there are higher normal stresses. There's some strange things called normal stresses. In particular, there's a second normal stress difference, which is tension in the vortex lines. So there's a higher tension in the vortex lines on the thicker side, and so it pulls fluid from the thinner side round to the thicker side and grows. And that does happen in experiments. Okay, so we've just this last week got that working. So there's a tick been added um, in the last week. So we've solved some of those things, and I can tell you more about some of them and not all of them. So I'm going to stop there. Now you better get a mic, yes. So is there an easy way of understanding why there exists two solitons for shear thinning, or, or and none, and it's unique for when n is greater than 1, or it seemed to be so? Um, I've, I've not put together a simple argument. Um, I've got a sort of very complicated, but it fizzles out, which is on this basis that it gets higher shear rate, so it gets thinner, so it shifts everything sideways. But it is a beginning of an argument that I don't have faith I, it's worth continuing. And what so locally for the shear thinning, the behavior is quadratic when the two branches meet. Yeah, yes. So what is it? So what happens in the Newtonian case? How? So how does that curve straighten out? So, it, so locally, how does the bifurcation resolve and become unique around n equals one? When n is just less than one, there. It follows the n equals 1, and very high up turns over. And you can, f you f I don't know whether I want to do the asymptotics of the asymptotics and follow that through. Um, I have done n equals exactly a half where there are logarithms, and, that, and you, then you can do n less than a half, which I've kept away from, where s various terms that I've exhibited change order. So there's a red term that crops up and jumps order. That I did show and didn't discuss it jumping order. At n equals a half. And then at n equals a half, you have to put a logarithm in. Equally on n equals one, there are logarithms later on in the expansion. Just one final thing. Are your solitons reversed from the traditional one? Because there is, normally when you think of a soliton, it's non-oscillatory in the front, but has a ringing. Yeah, I have a wiggle in the front because it's a capillary force, and it's not. It's actually a little different to traditional solid. I think it can be called a solitary wave without being called a solid ton. Um, so I can't do a collision of two solid solitary waves because there is a unique amplitude. Normally, in solitary wa solitons, you can have uh, f several different amplitudes, and bigger, wa larger amplitudes travel faster and will overtake a slower one. And after the overtaking, they emerge perfectly. I can't have any of that because there's a unique amplitude for the physical parameters. Okay. The, 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 the yes. Yes. First question here, and then another. There. Yes. Okay. I have two questions. One is, uh, You've been limited, I think. Yes, but keep yes. on. Can C be negative? Uh, no. Because no. because if we see the breakup of sometimes the jets, we see sometimes they drop forms and the waves propagate in the backward direction and then it forms. I'm sure. I'm seven. sure you do, and that would almost be certainly be inertia surface tension effects. I don't have any inertia that. So my C, I happen to know, happens to be bigger than three G and a bit. I, I can prove, you know, with, I, I can do mathematics as well as this. 
and I can prove that C has to be positive and bigger than actually a critical number. But I'm sure that in, in jets, because I'm also interested in jets for inkjet printing problems, mm -hmm. then it's, viscosity doesn't matter and it is, it, there's inertia. And so, yeah, there is a, when one breaks off, it does send a little reverberation backwards, which triggers the next one. Okay, the second question is related to something, speculation, that uh, in, in your equation you have a gravity term and the surface tension term balance of that. So if I, if I impose additional pressure gradient term, can I suppress this instability completely, appropriately? No, because my pressure gradient comes from the capillary pressure because there's air outside at and uniform. And in that air, if I impose a pressure gradient, favorable or adverse? So I don't think you've... Can, you would need to make the pressure in the air vary over the radius of the fiber because that's the wavelength of the instability and that could be quite difficult on a moving target. Um, there, there are some interesting co-flow devices but, but that, that, that's again moving it into the inertial jets that to make fine jets, it's a good idea to have a co-flow of air, and, and it's used in microfluidics. Um, I just have a general question about solitary waves. There is, uh, there is one way in which people approach it sometimes where they look at it in the phase space and they look for the propagation speed for which there is a homoclinic orbit. Yep. Um, have you ever found that analytically useful or is it just a geometrical uh, idea? Kaliadesis and Chen represented their solutions like that. But th it's, it's just a way of drawing a picture and it's much easier to draw the real H as a function of X for me because it then triggers how to do the asymptotic analysis. I was, I was so so I, I, I'm not saying it's universally a bad idea, but um, it didn't help in this problem. And it didn't help them get the right answer because they got the wrong answer. So, uh, can I just see that slide where you showed that uh, where the point turns around, where the solitary wave turns around and... Uh, uh, there's one here? No, no. The where you showed the uh, H max as a function. So, yeah, no, no, that slide. This one? Yes, this one. So, here you can see that uh, uh, H max uh, is quite high. So, so maybe... Uh, can can we do something by saying that uh, at at the point where this turning around is happening, then you have this dH by dg uh, equal no dg by dH equal to zero, and then from there you can sort of work out something. G does not seem to vary much, but that very so uh, maybe something can be obtained. Unfortunately. Um, H bar being large, um, 10 isn't a particularly accurately large number if you're chasing 1%. Um, so what, no, actually what, so what, what, I, what I do have is because I have not just the first approximation and the second, I can plot this and this does have a turning point. So it, it, it comes down it will come down and turn round and I can try and identify where the nose is and it gives a prediction so it comes down and then turns this way and so there's a nose on it I can um, find where that is and plot it on here and the answer is it sort of comes along here and then diverges. So it's not bad there, but it's getting poor here. So it's not bad here because we're talking about moderately large H's, but when we come down to here, we're drifting, you can see H is uh, 1 on 20, so there's 5%, and if there's a bad numerical coefficient, which there is, it's 15% errors in the prediction. And it's a kludge. I have no energy to get the next term down here. I don't know what power it is even, and I have worked very hard to get to there. 
And I'm not sure that some of the solutions of the transition region, I can actually get more than one significant figure. Um, when you've got the numerical solution behaving like x to the eighth, and you're interested in the constant term, it's very difficult to see a constant term when there's an x to the eighth behavior. If you take x to 10, that's 10 to the eighth. But I actually had to take x to 100. So this is, I'm looking for w 1 in 10 to the 16. And then I'd like significant figures. I like four-figure accuracy. So I have to get a computed solution to 10 to the 20. And it just doesn't work. So John, my question was regarding um, uh, your things decaying to 0 at finite distance for a shear thinning fluid. But in reality, as in, if you do an experiment and measure the viscosity for a real fluid, uh, uh, the, end, the, the index does not stay below 1 as you arbitrarily decrease the shear rate. So Agreed. That's the way out. <laughs> Pardon? You are correct. That, uh, and perhaps I was being too theoretical. Um, it, it, so so, so it, it tells you that if you're a theoretician and have a simple power law fluid, so the real law of viscosity will be a constant, a power law, and then a constant. So a Carew model, probably, or something like that. Then it, it, you'll get a sensible solution. It will decay exponentially to infinity using the high value of the viscosity. Um, it is some... Um, uh, but if you are a theoretician and take a simplified model of only a power law, then you're th in your theoretical world, you'll come across a finite distance. But and it, in re reality, things will have come crunching to nearly a zero, very near to a zero, in that same finite distance. They will still creep a bit. So uh, your analysis of the solitons being far apart uh, and not seeing each other would still be all right, because things decay. Actually, yeah, yeah, decay a lot. Oh, a second go. That's <laughs> you have to ask the audience, are you happy to be pestered by another question, or would you like tea? <laughs> One vote. Okay, you're <laughs> go on then. Well, I forgot, what was the length scale that you had, the physical length scale for the soliton used? It's, it's, it's 2 pi times the radius of the fiber. So there is, so that is that also fixed? Yeah, that doesn't seem to vary in the experiments, the spacing between the soliton to the width of the... Uh, the spacing the between them depends yeah. on the net fluid flow. Each soliton takes a certain mass with it, it depends what the input flow rate is. But the, s the length of each solitary wave is um, fixed at 2 pi, and it's the Rayleigh plateau instability length scale. It gets slightly bigger if when the mass of the drop is bigger than the sphere of radius A. So it is possible. To, you can make drops of arbitrary size. So if I somehow managed to be in a regime where I got a, a very large drop, much larger th than the radius of the fiber, for which this theory is not working, then it would start to get a bit longer. <laughs> 